good morning and hello are you sort of ready for this session now our session today is going to be on dance techniques in traditional theater ready for it okay so as all of you know india has one of the longest and richest traditions in theater some say that it goes back to as much as 5000 years now the origin of indian theater is closely related to ancient rituals and seasonal festivities a theater in india actually experienced several waves from within it the first of this is what is popularly called sanskrit theater but my submission is that sanskrit was merely the language in which the presentations or the productions were done at this period and a better terminology is likely to be classical theater now this was formal and well structured theater and it followed clearly enunciated conventions bharata's natya shastra was the earliest and most elaborate treatise on dramaturgy written anywhere in the world and this treatise contained some of those principles and conventions that i've just referred to the natya shastra is believed to have been written Uh, between the 2nd century BC and the 4th century AD in this natya shastra bharat muni consolidated and codified the various extant traditions of dance in india including mime drama dance and music natya shastra describes 10 classifications of drama ranging from one act to 10 act plays now no book of ancient times in the whole world contains such an exhaustive study on dramaturgy as does natya shastra it is addressed simultaneously to the playwright to the director and to the actor because to bharat muni these three were inseparable in the creation of a drama okay so let's continue in traditional indian drama expression was achieved through music and dancing as well as through acting so that a play could be a combination of operatic elements balletic elements and dramatic elements theater theorists from the earliest days conceived of plays in terms of two types of productions lokadharmi or realistic productions those which depicted the loka around us which involved the reproduction of human behavior on the stage and the second form was the natya dharmi or conventional form which was the representation of plays through a, a very stylized form of gestures and symbolism this was considered more artistic than realistic am i clear about the distinction between loka dharmi and natya dharmi so in that case we'll continue Sanskrit plays commenced with an elaborate ritual consisting of some 20 ceremonies called the purvarang involving music and dance which were performed before the play commenced of these nine of them were performed behind the curtain the sutradhar who was the director the chief actor and the stage manager clad in immaculate white enters with his two assistants onto the stage and offers worship to the presiding deity of the theater to ensure success to the producer and good luck to the actors after this only did the sutradhar summon the leading actors and open the play with a prologue which announced the time and place of the play and introduced the playwright theater halls were carefully constructed and decorated according to the traditional rules of architecture masks were not used and the subtlest interplay of emotions was conveyed through facial expressions gestures and speech entries and exits were dramatic 
and often set to dance movements. The adroit employment of the curtain made for heightened impact. The choice of themes covered a wide range and the treatment of the themes also varied greatly. Skits, comedies and intense melodramas were all written and presented. The absence of scenic effects was made up by a versatile histrionic technique. Sanskrit theatre depended on a high degree of audience knowledge and expertise. Only the refined sensibility audience could appreciate it. So are there any questions about the first wave? If no, no? Okay, we start on the second wave. Now the second wave in theatre in India came from the folk theatre of vernacular traditions. This form of theatre was being performed from about 1000 AD in almost every part of India. The emergence of this kind of theatre is interestingly linked with the change of a political setup in India. Now, the single power centre had broken up and power was going into the margin. Consequently, there came into existence many other centers of power. Each of them became centers of regional language developments as well. And so, historically, between the 14th, 15th and 16th centuries, folk theater emerged forcefully in different regions and it used different languages, the languages of the regions in which it emerged. Hence, there is this tendency to say Sanskrit theatre and regional theatre. Now, these plays that developed in these regional centres were initially purely devotional in tenor and typically revolved around religion, local legends and local variations of mythology. In fact, many of them were part of the florescence of performance that came in the wake of the Bhakti movement, a movement that was pan-India. Later, however, with changing times, regional theatre became more secular in content and began to focus on folk stories of romance and valour and biographical accounts of local heroes, but it was almost always local. Pan-Indian trends can be found, but the focus is more vernacular, regional and local. Although they are considered folk theatre traditions, all of these regional theatre forms still reveal Shastric or textual conventions. So the first of these vernacular based forms that I would like to discuss with you today is a theatre form called Ankhya Bhavana. It is from Assam and it emerged at the end of the 15th century. Now let's go to the etymology. Bhavana comes from Bhavana and it means expression. And Ankhya refers to the fact that the production did not have many acts but was one single act that was played out in a performance without a break. Ankhya Nats were written first by Sriman Shankadev, the saint who introduced the Bhakti movement into Assam, basing the plays on instances from Vaishnav lore. Particularly from the Srimad Bhagavat, he used an artificial language in the play which he called Brajavali. It was inspired by Brajabhasha. This language was used for dialogues and songs. Along with this language, there was use of a little portion of Assamese, which was newly minted there, and a smattering of Sanskrit. Therefore, these plays actually amalgamated a multilingual script. They also amalgamated something else, dance, music, theatre, masks and dialogue. These plays, Ankhya Bhavnas, were used to convey the spirit and teaching of the Vaishnav philosophy. They are in a way the audio-visual devices that were used to propagate Vaishnavism. They were performed, these plays, within the monasteries in Kirtanghars and outside the monasteries 
in community spaces called Namghars. Now Sriman Shankar Dev wrote six Ankhya Nats, of which five are on the Krishna theme and one is on Ram. These plays all have Bhakti Rasa as the predominant Rasa. Now like I mentioned earlier, these plays too retain some elements of dramaturgy that were reflected and referenced in the ancient texts of dramaturgy like the Natya Shastra. But they also introduced some new aspects suggesting that theatre is not just a corporate form incorporating many other arts but that it is a parampara, a continuing tradition arranged in a continuum over centuries without a break but with changes. The Ankhya Nat opens with a Purvarang type rendering of drumming and playing the cymbals in a segment called Gayan Bayan. Then enters the character of the Sutradhar as the main character in the play, irrespective of whoever be the hero in the play. And it is he who opens the play with a benediction called Bhattima or Nandi. Into the play, all the main characters make their entry at appropriate moments from behind a white cotton sheet called Ar Kapoor, just like the curtain called Yavanika, which is described in the Natya Shastra. They enter from below a nine lamp arc, representative of the concept of Navda Bhakti, while singing and dancing in a manner that establishes the character. Dance is a critical part of the Ankhya Bhavanas, and there were the Sutradhari dance, the Praveshar da Nach, Yudhor Nach, Gitor Nach, along with several other types of dances. Other leaders of the Vaishna faith in Assam later wrote plays called Bhavanas which were cast in the same mold. Shankadev's chief disciple Madhavdev also wrote six plays called Jhumuras. The dances in the Ankhya Nats, in the Jhumuras, in the later Bhavanas, as well as some daily and occasionally performed ritualistic dances, is what the newly recognized Satriya dance form comprises of. Satriya was given recognition in 2000, a full 42 years after it first staked a claim to a classical Since then, the dance has seen several changes, including in location, agenda and population. Today, more women dance it than men, although originally it was the preserve of male monks, particularly celibate monks. Over the years, from an ensemble dance, it has been transformed into a solo dance. It has grown in refinement and its repertoire has also grown with the inclusion of some creative pieces that use the traditional imagery. Kuchipuri, from the dance drama tradition of Kuchipuri village, is another classical Indian dance form that originated from a dance drama tradition. The dance form got its name from the village of Kuchipuri or Kuchelapuram, Kuchela was what Brahmin actors of this tradition were called. The form is believed to have appeared in a dream to Siddhendra Yogi in the 15th century. Originally, only male dancers performed various episodes from the Bhagavat, with the central character being that of Krishna's. During its revival, Kuchipudi was adapted to create a solo form for stage presentations, and its practice was opened to female dancers as well as people from the non-Brahmin caste. Like Satriya, this dance form truly has in it all the aspects of dance as mentioned in the Natya Shastra. Nrit, meaning pure dance. Nritya, meaning expressional. Nritya, meaning expressional dance. And Natya, meaning dance drama. The presentation of dance drama in Kuchipuri strictly follows the rules of traditional Sanskrit theatre. All four types of Abhinay are used. Angika, Vachika, Aharyam and Satvikam. The pure dance is usually based on complicated and fast rhythmic patterns complemented by a very flexible and mobile upper body. Though the mood of each item is based on the corresponding theme and characters and the origin of the style rooted in bhakti or devotion, the kinetics of Kuchipuri bring out the spirit of vivaciousness sensuality and femininity 
that is unique to the style. This is perhaps the influence of a popular and widely presented character of Kuchipuri, Satyabhama, an extremely candid and vivacious character from mythology. In its original avatar, Kuchipuri was an ensemble performance with the female roles being played by boys and young men of good looks. The director, called Sutradhar, played the most important role. He combined the roles of conductor, dancer, singer, musician, comedian, all in one. The Kuchipuri performance started with orchestral music which included Mridanga, Mardala and a pair of cymbals. To bless the performance, invocation of a deity was done. All this was followed by announcement of the theme of the play and the introduction of characters by the Sutradhar. But today's Kuchipuri is very different. Most of the performances are solo, done by female dancers. Today the expressional numbers are no longer sung by the danseuse herself, instead they are sung by the vocalists accompanying the performance. But in recognition of this self-singing custom, the late Guru Vempati Chinna Satyam initiated a tradition of the dancers silently mouthing the words of the song. The part where the deity is invoked has also been done away with as Kuchipuri has become more secular in its presentation. Today there is predominance of Sringar or erotic essence. Another notable feature of the modern day Kuchipuri dance is the dilution of the drama component. Kuchipuri has many features that are common to other classical dances of India. Even though it appears to be similar to Bharatanatyam in costume and makeup, Kuchipuri is very different in form and presentation. Kuchipuri carries the sensuousness and fluidity of Orissi with the geometric lines of today's Bharatanatyam. Additionally, Kuchipuri stands out easily identifiable by certain types of dances that are unique to its repertoire. Specifically, there is the Tarangam, which is a unique dance in which the dancer dances on the rim of a large brass plate while holding a plate with diyas in either hand and balancing a small vessel called a kindi on her head. It is in this acrobatic position that the dancer enters into a saval javab with the accompanying mridangam. This piece never ceases to captivate the audience. As in all other classical dance forms of India, Kuchipuri dance is both lyrical and interpretive and makes use of abstract dance sequences as well. Kuchipuri gives importance to Vakyarth Abhinay or a line by line treatment of enactment, while Bharatnatyam gives importance to Padarth Abhinay apart from being mudra oriented. Over the years, despite many changes, Kuchipuri dance retains its vibrancy with a marked stress on the dramatic outlook. It is because of these qualities and features that Kuchipuri enjoys great popularity and is recognized as one of the leading classical dance styles of India. The Ras Leela of Braj is an inspiration for Kathak dance. The traditional Ras performance in Vrindavan is famous throughout the Vaishnav world as a highly spiritual experience. The Ras Leela performance was started by Swami Sri Uddhavaghamanda Devacharya in the early 15th century in Vrindavan. He was a prominent saint of the Sampraday known as Nimbarka, one of the philosophical schools of Vaishnavism. The Vani literature of Vraj describes the Nikunja Dham the eternal spiritual abode of Radha, Krishna and the Sakis. As many new devotees of that time could not understand the Vraj language, Swami Uddhavaghamanda trained his celibate students to play the parts that appeared in the songs in order to get a visual representation of the Leela that was being described. Many were skeptical of this and attempted to initially thwart the first enactment. Legend has it that at the conclusion of the first Ras Leela, the Lord himself appeared and gave the actors his own crown and decreed that whenever a qualified actor was to take the part of the Lord, 
from the moment he put the crown on his head, it should be understood that he represents the deity. Since then, the tradition has remained and young Brahmin boys continue to enact the Leelas while wearing the uniquely shaped crown with the singing in accordance to the Drupad style of music. The music is sung in Braj Bhasha. The syllables played on the Pakhavaj to accompany the singing were researched by Kathak dancer Uma Sharma in the 1960s and she called them Natvari Kathak bowls. Apart from its distinct Mritta mnemonics, Kathak is based on devotional Krishna poetry of the medieval centuries and the highly cultivated court poetry of the 18th and 19th centuries which celebrated the sentiment of love. Let us now talk about Purulia Chow. The Hindi film Barfi featured a very endearing cameo with Purulia Chow artists. Purulia Chow is one of the three Chow styles of India, with Saraikala Chow, Mayurbhunj Chow being the other two. Like Purulia Chow, Saraikala Chow is also a mask dance, leaving only Mayurbhunj Chow as the non mask dance amongst the three Chows. It is difficult to ascertain the antiquity of these three major forms of Chow, but this forested region where they were performed was one of the most arduous areas to penetrate by an outsider. And given the absolute paucity of written records and incomplete historical accounts, it compels us to accept some possibly reconstructed notes. These notes refer to a few Hindu chieftains who gradually established their sovereignty within the small pockets of this region between the 12th and the 14th century. Slowly they influenced the life and customs of the native tribals. Today, layers of these influences accumulated over centuries are discernible in the cultural activities of these tribal people. It is believed that this dance was performed by pikes or soldiers to keep fit and hence the dance acquired the name Chow from Chavani or cantonment. Unlike the other two Chow dance varieties, Purulia Chow never quite enjoyed royal patronage and hence has an earthy folk feel to it. Its dance is a linear narrative devoid of any abstraction. Brief and simple rituals are conducted in front of a Shiva temple or the village square preceding the dance performance. The village head is the patron and he carries a brass pitcher on his head to his house where his wife sprinkles the water of the pitcher on the newly harv harvested crop, after which the performance begins. Till the early decades of the last century, these dancers and the form were loosely patronized by the Bagmundi ruler. But due to unproductive land and ever-failing rains, the support was insignificant. The performers too were forced to migrate to nearby urban cities like Calcutta in search of a living. Since 1961, when this form was first witnessed by an anthropologist in a remote village of Purulia district and the subsequent visits of performing groups in major cities around the world, the locals have formed their own parties in anticipation of a sponsored trip abroad. They have added more exciting combat scenes with more skillful pirouettes and somersaults. The costumes, especially the headgears, have acquired enormous size and jazzy decorations. Themes from the epics are performed, but with a liberal sprinkling of warfare scenes that also reflect their own perpetual conflict with hardships and life. Even the characters that are noble and heroic, like Ram and Sita, are depicted with forceful gestures. During the festival time, a special flask-shaped dance arena is prepared, where several dancing parties assemble to perform. Two or more kettle drums called dhamsas and an equal or more number of drummers accompany the groups. The tune is provided by a wind instrument called muri or maurai, in Purulia Chow, the chief drummer sings the introductory song or renders rhythmic passages during the performance. After the introduction of a heroic character, 
When he enters the arena, he runs to and fro several times in the narrow passageway before commencing his dance or dialogue with the other characters. On the other hand, a demonic character takes several vigorous turns, somersaults, jumps, turns towards sections of spectators for recognition and applause for his skill and virility. Such skillful acrobatic feats proliferate every year, leaving you wondering about the innovative and natural choreographic skills that such dancers possess in improvising exciting sequences. As you enter Chorida, a small village in Purulia district during the Chow season, the village that provides some of the best marks, practically every house and every member of the household is seen occupied in making masks or assembling decorations for headgears. The process of making masks is nearly the same. Due to thick layers of clay, paper and mud, these masks are heavier than the Sarai Kela masks. Moreover, the eyes of these masks are wide open, although the air passage of the nostrils is very narrow. The demonic nature of the character is ascertained by the knitted eyebrows, the thick hair growth on the face, which is achieved by pasting jute fibers. Thus, the variety of masks in this form is varied even though the thematic content is limited to stories from the epics and mythology. Scholar, activist and dancer of Bharatnatyam, E. Krishna Rao claimed that three artistic streams poured into Bharatnatyam, Deva Sadir, Kuruvanji and Bhagavat Mela Natakam. Sadir was the dance of the Devadasi, while Kuruvanji was a dance form that had come in from Andhra Pradesh, much like Bhagavat Mela Natakam. All three dances were once associated with the temples, but with the anti-Devdasi movement, the two women-oriented forms suffered severely, while Bhagavat Mela Natakam too had fallen on bad times by the 19th century itself. It is believed that a yogi called Narayan Tirtha migrated from Andhra in the 17th century to settle in Tanjavur district. He began the tradition of keeping alive the story of Narayan by enacting plays. Parijata Paharan and Rukmanda were two of his well-known plays. The tradition was continued after him by his disciples. In the 18th century, Venkatarama Shastri, by far the best Bhagavatar, authored 12 plays, six of which were found in Melatur. The tradition of Bhagavat Mela which dates back to more than 300 years, once flourished, nourished by the Naika rulers and the Marathas, as well as local chieftains, before it went into decline. Are there any questions in what we have discussed so far? If not, then I'd like to go on further. Now in 1930s, an attempt was made to revive the form which was languishing. Due to the interventions of E. Krishna Rao and Rukmini Devi Arundel, as well as the Sangeet Natak Academy's initiatives, this form got a new lease of life and its links with the Natya Shastra could once again be appreciated. One can also note the links with Bharat Natyam. For in Bhagavat Mela Natakam 2, the songs are enacted through Abhinay and Mudras. But you know, certain things don't change. And one of them is the fact that even today, all roles in the Bhagavat Mela Natakam are played by men. The best known Bhagavat Mela Natakam is Prahlad Charitram. And as you know, it depicts the story of Bhagat Prahlad. Now this is performed every year in Melatur on the occasion of the Bhagavat Mela Natakam Mahutsav, which coincides with the Narsimha Jayanti celebrations. One more form I'd like to just refer to because I know you know it all and that is that Kathakali is itself a dance drama form. So if we accept this, then what I need to say to you is that on the basis of all that we have discussed today, 
it is evident that the links between certain traditional theatre forms and dance techniques of a majority of the classical dance forms are intimately linked. They come out of the theatre form. They are the dance components within the theatre form. Of course, modern times changes come, but actually when you look deep, you realize that these dance forms actually come from these traditional theatre techniques. So this is where we end our session on dance techniques and traditional theatre forms. I hope you enjoyed it and that we understand what we set out to understand today. Thank you. Thank you.